the discrete time Fourier transform is often referred to as the DTFT. The DTFT, right? The discrete time Fourier transform is the first step in taking the continuous time, continuous frequency Fourier transform that we saw in the previous video and converting it to something that's slightly more accessible, but still not totally accessible by a computer. The equation that describes the discrete time Fourier transform is again written in terms of F, where we're taking capital F. I'm gonna put this omega here. So we're gonna be converting to frequency, omega. But instead of being an integral, because that's what continuous time would be. Instead, we're going now via a summation from n equaling negative infinity to infinity, where we have some function f, maybe I should not make that n, I should make that t so that we know that we're talking about time, negative infinity to infinity of f of t, ah, forget it, I'll do this, f of t, times e to the negative j omega t. So same thing, same general idea, right? It looks very, very similar to the integral, but instead, we don't have infinitesimal, we're not integrating with it with respect to t anymore. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking some fixed number of steps. Right? We're deciding some interval of t with which we were going to step across the negative infinity to infinity space and now perform the same computation. You might be wondering why this is a useful thing to do. Well, this is useful because that's the way that data is digitized, right? When we talk about a signal that's represented in a computer or numerically analyzed, we don't have continuous time. We have instead samples of that function, right? The, the microphone is picking up the voice my voice at some fixed sampling rate. And that's what is being marched across here. T represents the sampling rate at which we are, we are moving across this, this function. Now note, in this situation, omega here is still continuous because we can put any omega we want. It can be five, it can be 70, it can be 36.425, it doesn't matter. Any arbitrary omega that's continuous can still into the DTFT. And the fact that this is now conti still continuous is the reason that it can't be implemented by a computer uh, to perform analysis well. So again, this is very similar to our to our continuous Fourier transform, our general Fourier transform counterpart, but because it is operating in discrete time, because time is being sampled step by step, this actually introduces a new idea. It introduces the idea of sampling. And sampling, the moment you start sampling a signal, you no longer know that signal precisely. And this is the field of sampling theory. When you no longer know a signal precisely, that means that you only have an estimate of that signal at, and, uh, uh, in general. And you, worse, you only know the value of that signal, that, of that input, whatever this FFT is, at the particular times of interest. And that means that you don't actually know, you can never know the underlying signal that generated the samples that you got. What does this mean? Let's let's take a look at this for a second. There's, this is actually a very a very 
fundamental point of insight that helps explain once we start looking at what the plots of the discrete time forward transform look like, it'll all start to make sense. So let's pretend that we have over here some axis, and over here we have time, and we're looking at our f of t. All right, so we're looking at our f of t. And we've now got samples of our f of t. We've got, say we have one here. And these have to be equally sampled, right? They have to be equal spaces between our samples. And let's say we have another one here. And we have another one here. And we have another one here. Same spot, same spot, yep. And let's put another one back down here. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Okay. If I were to draw a curve, right, the simplest curve that I could come up with to go through these sample points, right? These, these represent my f of t's and i'm marching across i'm marching across t at this fixed interval pretend these are these, these all of these are equally spaced apart and i happen to get these points when i sampled it this time and this time and this time and this time let's say this represents i don't know you know five hertz or something it doesn't matter how fast i'm sampling this but let's say these are the points i got out of my sample if i wanted to now reconstruct the underlying signal that I sampled, what would it look like? Well, it might look, for example, something like this. It could look as an example like this. Oh, that didn't go through the point. Let's try it again. And that's a reasonable, right? It's just We can say it's a sine, a sine wave or a cosine curve, curve, doesn't matter, some sinusoid that is passing through these points perfectly in phase. Lovely. I guess I didn't get that last point correct, but let's just try it again. Okay, good enough. However, there is an equally likely and just as plausible explanation for the sampled points that we got here in green, and I'll, and I'll highlight them again one more time to make them clear. But this point and this point, that's the wrong color, isn't it? This point, and this point, this point, this point, and this point. There is an equally likely curve that I can draw, that I'll draw in just a moment. And I'll do that one in this light blue that could just as likely be the reason for the signal. And that's a, a, a curve that looks like this. Oh, that didn't go so right, but let's try this part again. And this curve happens to have a frequency exactly twice the, the blue one happens to have a frequency that's twice the yellow one. And note, it goes through every single one of the points just as well. Except I can't draw very well, so it looks a little funky. And now the problem is, the moment you start sampling the data, sampling the continuous signal, you cannot differentiate whether the underlying signal was the yellow one or the blue one, because they both result in the green sampled points. And there is no possible way at all to tell the difference. What's worse is that there's an infinite number of multiples of frequencies that could lead to exactly the same points on these greens, not just the yellow one or the blue one that's twice that, but also another curve that I could draw that's three times the yellow one, or four times the yellow one, or five times the yellow one. Every proper multiple of that frequency 
is going to end up, well, not half, sorry, not three times, but twice, 2x, 4x, uh, 8x, right? Every, every doubling of the frequency that we're talking about here, of the underlying frequency, the base frequency in yellow, would also hit these green points exactly. And thus, you would never be able to tell the difference as to whether you, you sampled from the yellow curve, the blue curve, or any of the other multiples that go through these points. That's what sampling theory is telling you. And this is a direct consequence. The reason for this idea, this idea thus will help you understand why the, the DTFT looks the way it does. So if we took a signal, some arbitrary signal, and it doesn't matter what, you know, we can take some, some, you know, some random signal, and we took its discrete time Fourier transform of it, we would get again something that is gonna be in terms of omega, with it being symmetric on both sides. And let's say that for the sake of argument, it looks something like that. Oh, let's, make it, let's make it symmetric. So it looks like that, and it looks like that. Just for the sake of argument. You are gonna end up with an exact copy of this Fourier, of this transform, shifted exactly two pi away on both sides. There will be a perfect copy of that transform over here and over here. Both of these represent this blue curve, for example. In fact, let's put those in those colors because then it'll make very crisp sense. If the Fourier transform of the yellow line the yellow time series line represents this. Then you're going to get Fourier transforms of every double, every 2x double, right? Every multiple of that frequency set over here on this side. So that's going to be the blue one here and another copy of the blue one here. Because again, you can't differentiate multiplying by two frequency positive or two frequency negative. And that is a very, very critical concept. The moment you sample the data, the moment you have intervals with which you are looking at your signal, you end up with an infinite number of copies of the Fourier transform. You have to, because again, you can't differentiate between these. What this means is that practically, if we are dealing with sampled data, and if that's all we ever deal with in the real world, your CD-ROM samples at 44,100 hertz. Not that anyone uses CD-ROMs anymore, but right, the frequency of sampling of a CD is 44,100 hertz. For every second of data, there's 44,100 points in the time domain. Your MP3 files are sim similarly sampled at something like this. They're, sometimes they'll be at 44,000, they call that CD quality. Otherwise, they'll be sampled at you know 22,000, or sometimes they'll go even crazy at like 96,000. Really high-end audio equipment can sample at 96,000 or something like that hertz. 96,000 uh, 96, hertz, yeah. What this fundamentally means is that when you are storing digitized, discrete, sampled data, you have to be mindful of your sampling rate and what that does to your discrete time for your transform representation. Why? Well, the rate at which you sample represents now, the, will give you an upper limit on the lowest frequency, the, the, whatever the yellow will look like, the lowest yellow that you can properly disentangle from anything else. What do I mean by this? Yellow in this case is the lowest frequency that we can perfectly understand. 
Well, not necessarily, but let's just pretend it is. If this was, right, if this yellow was the lowest frequency that we could, sorry, the highest frequency that we are no longer unambiguous about, meaning any frequency slower than yellow, we, we can perfectly reconstruct up until yellow, and then every multiple of we have very little insight into, that yellow, right, this actual highest level frequency, corresponds to something over here at the edge of the, of the discrete time Fourier transform. And since these are copied out every two pi, the sampling rate will determine how far apart these blobs of the Fourier transform are. And the slower the sampling rate, the less ticks you take, the closer these two become in the, in the frequency space. What's worse, is that should these tips ever overlap, should this tip ever overlap with this tip because you're sampling too slowly, you no longer can perfectly discriminate the frequency information that is contained in the signal. What does this mean? Fundamentally, if what we believe, if you know, for example, that there's no actual frequencies of the color blue or higher, in your signal, right, in the signal that you're measuring, then you can reject all the other copies of the discrete time Fourier transform, except for this one. In fact, you do precisely that. You do what's called a, a block filter, where you just go in and, um, or a, a, a brick wall filter, and you just pick out just this section of the Fourier transform. You throw away this and this and all the other multiple infinite copies above and below because you know that the highest frequency of interest that you, your signal can contain is over here, right? Within, within the walls, within this Fourier transform. It's within, it's, it's within, it's somewhere between this space before the next copy begins. Then guess what? You're safe. You'll never get confused about what frequency information is present in the original signal versus its two pi shift. If you have these that are overlapping, you have a problem called aliasing. Aliasing is, occurs when you haven't sampled fast enough and your tips of your discrete time Fourier transform are overlapping, confusing your ability to determine whether or not power in some particular space belongs to this copy of the Fourier transform of the DTFT or this copy of the DTFT. And the way to solve that is by increasing your sampling rate. Now comes the fun part. When you increase your sampling rate, the spacing at which these start to separate is exactly by half the increase in your rate. So if you increase by two hertz, your sampling rate, you push space, you add one hertz of gap here and one hertz of gap here. That's why, it's, that's why you need to increase by two to get both sides. Now, with that understanding, you can now, you can now understand why CD quality is 44,100 hertz. It's because the, the, the range of typical human hearing is cut off at around 20, hertz, 20 kilohertz. And based on the Nyquist frequency, the Nyquist frequency is 2x, the highest frequency of interest. That's what the Nyquist frequency is. It's, it's, it is telling you that if, as long as you are sampling at twice the highest, at greater than, at greater than or equal to, and you always want to be slightly greater than, greater than 2x the highest 
frequency of interest for the particular signal that you're trying to capture, then you'll be able to perfectly reconstruct your signal. Why? Because if you take the inverse discrete time Fourier transform of the block of interest right along the center, you're guaranteed not to have the tips overlap and thus you can completely reconstruct your signal by taking the inverse of this Fourier transform. That's phenomenally powerful. And so with all of that, you now know why we have CD quality sampling at 44,100 Hertz. The range, the upper range for normal human hearing is 20 kilohertz. Normal human hearing is 20 kilohertz. What then is the Nyquist frequency for human hearing? If you were to digitize a signal to make sure that a, a typical uh, individual right, can hear that sound that you're hearing now properly reproduced when if a computer is playing it back, you need to sample at twice that upper limit of what people can hear, which is two times 20 kilohertz, which is 40 kilohertz. And just for good measure, they rounded that out to 44,100. There's, 44, There's a few other nuances behind that, but it's basically ensuring that they are above the Nyquist frequency of human hearing, which is 20 kilohertz. Thus ensuring that when they take the DTFT, they're not overlapping in this space, such that if people cannot hear about 20 kilohertz, then that is the highest frequency of interest. We're not interested in, in capturing sound above 20, 20 kilohertz for the purposes of human hearing. Very powerful ideas. This is sampling theory. It is fundamentally indistinguishable and inseparable from the discrete time Fourier transform because the moment you start marching along a signal by sampling as opposed to taking the continuous signal, which is what the only way that we can deal with it in computers, then you are forced to reconcile with an infinite possible number of frequencies that could have resulted in that sampled set of green dots that you have. And thus, in your Fourier domain, you end up with copies of the Fourier transform, an infinite number of copies of your Fourier transform, copied and stamped out every two pi spacing. And as a result of that, right, with every two X multiple of your, of your of your omega. As a result, you now can then derive and understand and explain why the Nyquist frequency is what it is. In order for you to faithfully reproduce any fundamental signal that you are measuring, if you know the highest frequency of interest, be ensured that you're sampling it twice that to give yourself enough room so that the copies of your DTFT do not overlap so that you are now able to reject all other higher frequency versions of the signal you're trying to measure because you know they don't exist. They are not the solutions that gave you these green dots and that only the one in the middle, the primary one of interest, the primary copy of the DTFT is indeed the one that led to the green dots of interest. And thus you can take only that copy out, throw out all the others and do the inverse of this to get you your reproduced signal perfectly.